Okay, so without any further delay, let's go into talk and uh, uh, yeah, okay. okay, Zoom doesn't like my keyboard, so I need to use the mouse. Okay, so um, basically the very, very quick sum, uh, summary is um, as follows. Um, I, I'm going to talk about robots, as I said, in particular, the, the work uh, we have done on trying to get robot, uh, robots to understand the world uh, around them. So um, in particular through the, the visual capabilities. And, um, and the approach that we have used basically is what we call hybrid approach that integrates the, the kind of state-of-the-art uh, deep learning techniques for object recognition with additional sources of knowledge. And I will um, talk quite a bit about this uh, uh, hybrid element because uh, I believe um, that even in the age of deep learning, uh, um, unless you augment uh, um, uh, the, the, the sort of state-of-the-art deep learning techniques or other machine learning techniques uh, with uh, other uh, types of reasoning, other types of knowledge, you are not going to get the kind of performance uh, um, and let's say you, you're not going to exhibit the level of intelligence that is required in a lot of uh, real world sit, uh, situations. Um, and of course, I, I, I want to make these uh, extremely concrete. So basically uh, all this discussion will be grounded uh, on a scenario that we have um, um, implemented uh, in which basically we have a robot called Hans. Uh, Hans is the acronym for health and safety. Um, and basically this robot uh, um, has been uh, uh, trained to go around the lab and spot any uh, situation in the lab which is a violation of uh, health and safety guidelines. So um, now uh, talking about robots, uh, uh, basically, you know, technically Hans is what is called a service robot. Uh, robot and uh, in, in the past few years, there, there's been quite uh, uh, a nice explosion of uh, uh, service robots in, in various uh, uh, industries. Uh, the photo on the, on the top left uh, is uh, from the CIROC um, um, competition, robotic competition, which one, uh, one of the tasks was to serve uh, uh, people in a real uh, restaurant, you know, in a Costa restaurant in Nathan Keynes. And then, indeed, you can see here on the top left, uh, two, two customers being served by a Tiago robot. Um, but even uh, uh, better, that, that, that was simply, you know, a, a competition which various Euro European teams co competed, you know, on, on this uh, benchmark. Um, but more interesting, if you look at the um, image on the top, uh, uh, sorry, on, on the bottom right corner, um, these are essentially delivery robots. Uh, uh, and I believe Milton Keynes, the, the city where the Open University is based, has been the first city in UK, and uh, one of the first cities in the world to have autonomous robots roaming the, street, uh, roaming the streets uh, and delivering food. So the, the point is that this is um, well beyond academia. These, these applications of service robots are now um, uh, not just established in, 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 in specific industrial scenarios, but they're sort of everyday. If you walk around Milton Keynes, you will bump into deliver robots uh, uh, pretty regularly. Um, okay, so let me show you, um, just to give you a taste of what we are going to talk about, and then uh, um, I will uh, take a little bit of a digression, we'll talk about a little bit more about AI paradigms. So uh, basically, um, when we talk about detecting health and safety issue, you know, you, you, you have to um, understand there is a robot that goes around the lab, he needs to uh, recognize objects, um, but it's not just uh, um, recognize objects, it needs to sort of interpret the situation. So for example, you know, a, a possible health and safety violation is when um, you get, like in this picture, you get a, a book which is uh, uh, next to electric heater. Now, uh, the health and safety guidelines basically says that the electric devices uh, uh, cannot be next to flammable material, which means, uh, you know, um, Hans needs to understand, okay, portable heater is an electric device, uh, electric device can overheat, uh, and uh, um, a book is made of paper, paper is flammable, and therefore uh, you have this uh, health and safety violation. Um, so as you can uh, uh, see straight away, um, it is, uh, um, oh, sorry, let me just remove the bar, I can't see, okay. As you can see, so the way there are uh, quite a number of uh, capabilities that are required uh, from a robot in order to be able to, to perform this job as a kind of health and safety inspector. First of all, you need to understand, you know, you have to have knowledge of the health and safety rules, like the one I just mentioned. 
Um, of course, you operate in a real world environment, so you need to identify objects in the environment. And this object identification is, is much more complicated than a lot of the standard image recognition benchmarks, which are based on rather kind of sanitized photos. Um, this is uh, you know, the real world. In the real world, you have day, you have night, you have sun, you have clouds, um, people move stuff around, etc. Et so it's a much more challenging problem. And then, of course, you need to understand the, the, the relevant domain entities, like for example, a book is made of paper, a paper is flammable material. And, um, and of course, among other things, you also need to understand special relations, at least in order to interpret guidelines which talk about uh, a book or a flammable material cannot be next to, to a source of heat um, or an electrical appliance. So, uh, so there's quite a lot that you, you, you know, Hans needs to, um, to be able to handle. So how, how to go about uh, building hands then? Um, so let, let's take a little bit of a, a regression and, and let's talk a little bit of AI paradigms. Um, as uh, um, Newell, uh, uh, Shaw and Simon say, you know, well back in 1958 at the very beginning of AI, basically uh, what AI is about is building intelligent machines, you know, machines like hands that can perform a job that requires a certain degree of uh, of intelligence. So it's um, what they call the nicely, um, with a nice expression, a synthetic approach to intelligence. And of course, over uh, the past uh, uh, 60 plus years, in fact, it's almost 70 years since the, the um, Dartmouth uh, uh, workshop, which was like, which is considered the best of AI, there have been a number of paradigms uh, that, that have been proposed. Um, indeed, the, one of the very first ones was uh, the, um, uh, the one by Newell and Simon um, on uh, GPS, the general problem solver. And it's quite interesting because, uh, you know, in the early days of AI, the, the idea was uh, essentially that uh, the mind uh, was uh, some kind of computer and the reasoning was uh, essentially logical reasoning. Um, and, uh, and therefore the, the problem solver, you know, worked on, um, on a search space in which operators were primarily logical operators as, uh, um, as shown in this, um, in this slide. And the typical kind of benchmark task uh, was chess. And on the bottom right corner, you can see uh, Newell and Simon uh, playing chess. Um, and it's actually quite interesting uh, because although they, uh, Newell and Simon introduced a lot of important ideas that are still uh, very relevant, for example, like uh, uh, um, the notion of AI as search, which is, pretty much as relevant today as it was in 1958. Um, a lot of other things, they didn't get it right. I mean, uh, you, 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 can't, uh, you can't really solve the most interesting real world problems simply um, by mapping the, the problem to a nice logical framework. Or at least the, the, the jump is too big from, from the complexity of the world to the nice uh, uh, logical reasoning as expressed in these, uh, in these operators. Um, in fact, interestingly, you know, I, I recommend that there's a book by Gary Kasparov uh, called Deep Thinking, which is basically about AI and chess. Um, and they say that, um, of course, Newell and Simon, when they were talking about these things and they were using chess as an example, it was primarily because neither of them could play chess properly. You know, they really didn't understand chess to the level of, um, you know, a, a world champion like Gary Kasparov. And indeed, chess players they don't search spaces the way uh, Newell and Simon um, thought about chess. The, it's all the pattern recognition, uh, which is a completely different uh, problem solving paradigm. Um, so basically the limitations of, uh, of this initial paradigm uh, were quickly uh, identified. So the, essentially the next big paradigm was really the, the knowledge base uh, paradigm where essentially people realized where well, it's not really about having uh, modus ponens uh, or um, understanding the, um, the logical properties of this junction, but it's really about uh, uh, acquiring domain knowledge from experts, like in this case, uh, of the, in the case of the mycin system, it selects antibiotics uh, for bacteremia um, and try to uh, duplicate the reasoning process of, uh, of an expert. So in this case, for example, you know, uh, this reasoning process shows that um, if somebody has a low um, uh, white uh, uh, blood cell count, um, then eventually you uh, can deduce that uh, his, somehow his, immune, his immune system is somehow compromised, um, which, you know, you can then uh, conclude that there is some kind of infection 
and then you can try and refine which you know understand which kind of infection specifically we are talking about. Um, so this is all good, but is is not very um, is all extremely domain specific. So what then uh, uh, Bill Clancy did uh, um, in analyzing a number of expert systems of this kind, he said, well, actually, it is not just uh, about domain knowledge, but it's also about these uh, um, more general uh, problem solving methods like this risk classification that can be used in a variety of different domains. So in particular, in this case of mice, what they are doing, they are taking some data, they are um, uh, carrying out a, a number of abstraction steps until uh, they conclude that we are talking about uh, a, a immune, um, uh, immune deficiency or a compromised host. And then there's a, a heuristic step, which then leads to a category of uh, solutions. And then the, you refine to a more specific solution. So essentially is this uh, um, abstraction step going up and heuristic step, let's say going horizontally and then a refinement step, which is called the heuristic classification model. And this paradigm pretty much dominated the AI in the 80s and 90s. And in my own PhD was in, um, in parametric design. Uh, and basically what, what we did in those days was really to, uh, to take a, a big class of tasks uh, that were amenable to AI treatment, like uh, design or scheduling or planning or diagnosis, and really understand what was uh, the structure of the task and what was the kind of problem solving that uh, um, was uh, was required for that task. So essentially, the level of abstraction uh, went up uh, significantly, um, but the paradigm remained that of um, the knowledge-based system. Essentially, the the, the idea was uh, um, essentially the intelligence is uh, um, is a side effect of knowledge. So if you want to have intelligent problem solving, you really need to, to have uh, um, to represent explicitly uh, a large body of knowledge, which is relevant to, um, uh, to the specific task that you want to carry out and the specific problem solving method that, uh, that you want to use. Um, and of course, this knowledge-based paradigm was quite dominant uh, for a number of years. And, uh, and, and in particular, the side effect of this notion that you, know, you need uh, lots of knowledge in, in, in order to be intelligent, basically. This led to um, a variety of um, activities uh, uh, to do with building very large knowledge bases. And of course, the most, uh, well, the, 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 the pioneering one was the psych knowledge based, um, a project that started in, in 1984. But then, um, so there was all this flurry activity, but the bottom line was that uh, um, nowadays, uh, the, the dominant paradigm is not really the knowledge-based paradigm, but it's really the deep learning paradigm, where essentially you, know, you have these uh, sort of super clever machine learning with uh, multiple layers of neurons on top of each other, which uh, um, provided enough data are, um, are available, uh, produce uh, uh, rather exceptional results. Um, for example, uh, you, you all know, I'm sure about chat GPT, but I don't know um, how many of you know that um, um, they've tried chat GPT on uh, um, a classic biology um, test uh, in the States for high school students. Um, on, and out of 60 questions, uh, chat GPT got 59 uh, correct, which basically means, you know, is, uh, is basically performs as well as a top uh, high school student. Now, the um, interesting thing was that uh, um, in during the, um, I think uh, during the twenties, let's say between some for a period of almost ten years between two thousand and two, two thousand three to two thousand thirteen. Oops, sorry. Um, the the Hallen Institute actually worked on the same on on, on this goal. Get, you know, building in the project hell or building a system that was able to to do biology, chemistry, uh, biology and chemistry, physics at the at the level of a high school student. Um, and they said they pretty much failed. You know, I thought they did a lot of interesting work. They didn't achieve uh, the performance that ChatGPT uh, was able to achieve. Um, and uh, the, um, one can argue that the reason why they did that was essentially they were stuck into knowledge-based paradigm as opposed to um, working on uh, um, being based on a deep learning paradigm. Now, in, in reality, both paradigms, to some extent, they are based on, on data and knowledge, but um, 
it, it is interesting that uh, the quite flagship project uh, that used uh, the knowledge based paradigm didn't didn't really reach the objectives that they wanted to reach, while ChatGPT you know, reasonably quickly, once it was applied to you know, solving biology problems, they, uh, they were able to do it. So, uh, so yeah, deep learning is the, is the current you know, dominant paradigm. However, you know, it, it is also the case that uh, um, there are some uh, um, limitations uh, and non-trivial limitations. Uh, first of all, you know, you need data. Um, if you do have data, then uh, the performance decreases quite dramatically. Um, and also, uh, there is a certain element of brittleness, again, because it's so much data, you know, data driven. That is, uh, as long as, as soon as uh, they um, uh, encounter, you know, uh, deep learning system, encounter a scenario which, uh, which is novel. Um, then uh, um, the performance decreased dramatically. And this is not, you know, you don't have to come up with any esoteric uh, scenario, you know, you just do object recognition uh, instead of doing on, uh, you know, pictures provided by Amazon, you do it in the real world and uh, the performance decreased dramatically simply because the real world is, is much more dynamic than the Amazon catalog. Um, but then, the, you know, uh, I, I would argue that there is a kind of fundamental uh, um, issue here that is, uh, um, certainly compared to the way um, people learn, you know, people learn, you know, we, we, we learn concepts, um, which is different from learning patterns uh, as uh, uh, deep learning systems do, or, or in general machine learning systems do. So let me give you uh, some example of what I'm talking about. So is, uh, um, um, can, can anybody tell me what, what is this? Anybody switch on the audio for a second? Tell me what is this? Axel? Cold start and virtual. Exactly. So you pass the test. Now, uh, have you ever seen a Volkswagen Beetle that looks like a ball or a big a giant <laughs> ball? Definitely not. No. Exactly. So you see, uh, you uh, uh, you are a human being. You have demonstrated that you are a human being and not a chatbot, even if I cannot see you right now. Because uh, um, you, you somehow you have the concept of Volkswagen Beetle. You have not just uh, been trained to recognize images of Volkswagen Beetle, where you know typically it looks like he has four wheels, uh, he's uh, you know much wider uh, than tall, uh, etc. Et et um, you you take uh, you you train uh, um, uh, a machine learning or deep learning system on uh, you know one thousand pictures of Volkswagen Beetle uh, beetles. And uh, um, there is very high probability that if you show this uh, picture, they, they will not be able to recognize because uh, they just recognize patterns, in particular geometrical patterns, as opposed to the concept like, hey, that uh, you know that uh, back end looks exactly like 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 that the rear lamp there uh, looks exactly like a Volkswagen Beetle, and the, the wheel looks you know says Volkswagen X Y X Y. And I give you another example, which actually I did just a couple of days ago for a different presentation. Uh, this is um, a DAL E that is, you know, these um, one of these uh, chat GPT uh, system, which are like systems, that is able to generate art from uh, um, a, a description. So I told uh, DAL E, say, okay, uh, can you uh, generate the picture, the picture? Can you generate the image of a lion with an Etruscan iPhone? And of course, you know, DAL E is amazing. So it just does, you know, generate a lion with an iPhone. Um, the problem is that, of course, this is an Etruscan lion with an iPhone, which is not the same thing as a lion with an Etruscan iPhone. And moreover, in Etruscan time, there were no iPhones. So my um, um, the spec I gave is nonsensical. Um, but actually, is, but the problem is Dali hasn't got any domain. You know, doesn't really know what he's talking about. Basically, what he does, he has a, a huge database of images annotated images, you know, billions and billions of annotated images. So it means that as, as every time we ask him to produce an image, he can construct a new one from the database, but doesn't necessarily mean that he understands uh, uh, what we're talking about. And therefore, if I say something nonsensical, he just uh, uh, follows up. So, um, okay. So um, as a result of that, there's been uh, um, quite a lot of interest in this hybrid AI, you know, integrating machine learning with explicit knowledge representation. Uh, and indeed, for the past, uh, I think it's now three or four years, there's been um, um, the AAAI make um, uh, workshop um, 
uh, one of these spring symposium uh, AI triple AI spring symposium workshops, uh, which is really about uh, um, uh, uh, you know getting together people who are interested in, in the integration of machine learning with uh, knowledge engineering, knowledge based systems in, in general. In fact, I also noticed that just in the past. Uh, uh, two or three months, there have been a, a, a couple of uh, major reviews of the field, um, primarily because there is, yeah, there is a, a lot of interest in, in the integration of these two uh, paradigms. So uh, let's go back now to, uh, actually, yeah, let, no, let's make me, an, 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 uh, of course, if I, have, you know, if I can blow my own trumpet, as, as, as we say in England, uh, of course, this is stuff that, to be honest, we have been doing for at least uh, for, uh, well, since 2005, 2006, so we are talking about uh, 17, 18 years. Um, indeed, in 2008, we published uh, um, this paper on uh, a new generation of semantic web applications. And basically, what we talked about, what, what we say was uh, um, a quick summary is that um, you know the semantic web and, and more in general the av av availability on a huge scale of data. Uh, means we now need to move from the classic logical reasoning, or, or you know. Or, or inferential reasoning or traditional knowledge bases to uh, basically having this intelligence a side effect of scale. So how do you handle uh, how do you handle scale? You can't handle scale. You know you can't handle uh, billions of, of, of data points or billions of Im annotated images, for example, um, with um, traditional inferences in a traditional uh, uh, knowledge base. What you need is you know you need machine learning. You need uh, um, statistics, you need data money, you need methods that are able to handle this, uh, um, this scale, uh, extract significant, you know, interesting patterns. But then, you know, like in the case of the Etruscan lion, if you want to make sense of this pattern, um, you need knowledge. So essentially, the kind of paradigm that we have advocated now for, as I say, for, almost, for well over 10 years is essentially to try to combine the uh, ability of managing huge amounts of data of uh, um, data mining and machine learning systems with uh, um, essentially uh, sense-making capability that uh, um, the, the large-scale knowledge base that have been built over the past uh, 20, 30, 40 years uh, bring, bring to the plate in order to, to come up with uh, um, and meaningful interpretations of uh, uh, phenomena that you want to study. So, for example, in, in our work, uh, um, Axel referred to our work on scholar analytics. One of the first things we did was to um, automatically uh, generate a taxonomy research areas in computer science from 6 million papers. And again, without giving too many details, uh, because it will take another hour, uh, essentially the way we did was that we use large scale uh, uh, data mining on 6 million papers. And we identify possible uh, um, uh, terms that refer to research areas using a variety of uh, such as statistical heuristics. But then we bring on all the knowledge we can find in the real world uh, from Wikipedia, from Scopus, uh, but also, for example, from uh, uh, call for papers uh, um, to validate whether what we found are really uh, research areas and therefore they are associated with conferences, workshops, et cetera, or they are not. And end result is um, the computer science ontology. You know, you can find that the URL there, CSO, KMI, OpenAC UK, which is the, the, the by far the largest uh, ontology of research areas in computing uh, um, um, that, that is available. Uh, just, just as a comparison on the ACM, uh, um, Taxonomy is 1,000, has 1,000 research areas. Our taxonomy has 10,000 research areas uh, and has been formally uh, adopted by Springer Nature and is actually in use in um, you know, a variety of academic commercial organizations. So, the, so essentially the, the point is that the, in terms of high um, artificial, intelligence, artificial intelligence paradigms, uh, I'm not going to tell you anything new, but the interesting thing is that how this kind of sort of Generic paradigms can be instantiated in a concrete uh, problem, which is uh, getting a robot to perform intelligently in, in the real world. So uh, let's uh, uh, move back to uh, Hans. So I, I think it's actually uh, a good point to have a, a, a quick stop, just, just in case anybody has, uh, has a quick question on this first part, uh, please uh, shout now. Otherwise, um, in 10 seconds, I will move on.
Anybody has any questions? I do, if you don't mind. Yeah, go, go ahead. Is, is that Axel? Uh, so yes, Axel. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, go ahead. Um, I was wondering about the whole idea of scalability and knowledge, which you just pointed out. So that's been basically an important problem in the community for a while. Do you think we're there yet? I mean, I have more questions I'll ask later, but do you think that we've reached a point where we can actually scale up knowledge as well as scaling up um, data in the sense of uh, basically vectorial machine learning? Um, what the, um, I mean, when, when you talk about scale, it all depends on what you want to do. Yeah. So what, what, what I emphasize in, in, my, um, in my presentation so far was that uh, the, 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 the way knowledge-based system operated, uh, you know, they, they operated through rules or through, you know, or, or through inference mechanism, essentially to that, uh, you know, you remember that I showed you that picture of the, the search space with the operators, yeah? Now, so you, you have these operators and the operators apply to a knowledge base. Now, if you're talking about uh, billions and billions and billions of uh, data points, um, then uh, that paradigm, um, I would say, still has scalability problems. You need, you, need, you need to do something else, yeah, if you want to, 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 to infer. So, uh, and of course, the, the other thing, of course, in some cases, you don't even have the knowledge in, in, in the format that, that, that you want to have. So the, so the answer to your question is, if you're talking about, for example, knowledge graph technology, if you're talking about uh, triple stores uh, and Sparkle, etc., like, yeah, I think the level of performance now um, is uh, uh, is extremely good. Uh, you know, it's it's pretty similar to the the level of performance you have in in the area of very large uh, databases. Um, but uh, if you're talking about uh, um, doing things where you have a lot of unstructured data together with structured data, or you need to analyze lots and lots of data points to extract uh, meaningful patterns uh, to get insights, then uh, you, you, you can't do that with, you know, with, I would say with knowledge technology. You have to do, you have to use other methods and then bring in the knowledge technology. That, that, that would be my, I would say, um, my standpoint or my claim. Thanks. Uh, okay, so let's let's move back to Hans then. Um, so um, so as, as I say, the the, the if, if you want to recognize uh, recognize objects in the world, uh, you have to start from uh, uh, of course a, a, a neural network based object recognition, which is uh, which is the state of the art. So um, the the scenario we are talking about uh, is the one of health and safety in KMI, which means uh, you basically uh, want to recognize the typical objects that, that are in KMI. So what, what we did, uh, we, we just did a little bit of auditing um, and uh, we, we came up with a, a, such a, 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 a catalog of uh, 60 distinct classes. Um, and we sent, uh, we sent Hans around to uh, essentially collect that data. And Hans came back with, over one thousand, you know, about one thousand six hundred uh, uh, observations um, of what, what that we call instances. It's not really instances in in the sort of no logical sense because, of course, Hans may actually uh, find the same object twice without recognizing it is the same object. So um, it's just uh, let's say um, observations of. Uh, individual items in, in KMI. And of course, you know, um, Axel will appreciate the fact that KMI is a place where you can find the printer, but you can also find an electric guitar and, and because of the nature of research labs. So those, those can, so the, the, the collection is quite heterogeneous. And of course, there are also health and safety specific uh, items that are really important for the, this application domain, like fire extinguisher, uh, science, etc. etc. So, uh, so as I say, that you know, we send the hands around. Hands collect all these uh, uh, observations. We equip the hands with uh, essentially two state of the art, uh, at least state of the art when we were doing this uh, this work, which is now about uh, uh, two um, between two and three years ago. Um, in particular, we use two um, uh, two reasoners, uh, uh, two deep learning based reasoners from. Uh, um, Zeng et al. One is called Nnet, one is Knet. Nnet is particularly good 
um, when uh, um, you are trying to identify new uh, um, classes, uh, while Knet is the one that works best with uh, uh, known objects. And basically, um, uh, I mean, you know, uh, as you can see, uh, there, there are a number of uh, uh, sort of results, but the, the really important one is the one highlighted. That basically, if you're talking about um, uh, the instance based uh, measure, in, in which means uh, if you're talking about recognize individual items as opposed to um, performance on, uh, um, on a class based uh, uh, um, test set. And essentially, you know, it doesn't really go higher than 50%. You know, every 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 two observation one on average will be will be wrong. So it's not that bad, but of course, as you can see, is much much worse than what, uh, for example, Knet can do on the Amazon uh, uh, test bench, where they really have um, you know close to 100% uh, uh, success. And the reason for that is simply um, the the difference between the real world and a slightly sanitized world of uh, image recognition. So, but this is this is essentially what, what we want. We want to, I mean, of course, if this was 100%, we, could, we would not have been able to improve. So we would have been very happy. So the fact that it only gets 50% is perfect. It gives us a, a decent baseline on which to try and improve. Now, so what, uh, so why, um, um, why there are so many mistakes? So, um, so what we did, we did an analysis of all the errors that uh, uh, K8 did, and uh, I'll show you a couple of examples. So th this one is quite a, a funny. One. In fact, they're all quite funny, but this one is particularly funny because this, basically this uh, armchair um, seen from the back um, was recognized as a mug, uh, and of course, uh, you know, nobody. I don't think I, I've ever seen a mug as big as that armchair. Um, and it's again, you know, is these things that uh, these uh, these deep learning systems don't have knowledge of the world. They don't understand that uh, um, a mug cannot be that big because uh, otherwise the KMI people will have to be about twenty meters uh, tall to use uh, uh, that mug in proportion. So, um, uh, so that's that's an interesting case in which is simply, you know, if if the AI system knew about sizes, uh, this error could be eliminated. Um, then there is another one which is even more interesting. That is, uh, um, we have um, um, a radiator. Of course, we have many radiators. Um, but of course, uh, if you do different observations over time, these radiators uh, um, sometimes uh, may look like a window with blinds because of the reflection from, from the sun. Um, um, so I, I, I say the opposite way around. Uh, that uh, that is actually a window, but because of the reflection of the sun with the blinds, he, he, he appears to be a radiator because it doesn't appear to be just glass, but it appears to be a shiny surface with uh, with some uh, um, um, sort of uh, um, structure. And uh, um, but again, the, the interesting thing is that uh, you know a, a human being will not make this mistake, or at least will not make this mistake uh, more than once. Because of course, the moment you um, know that there is a window in a particular spot, you also have knowledge about the fact that windows uh, are not movable objects. So if on Sunday morning you saw a window there, it's very unlikely the next day that window is, has been replaced by a radiator. It's not impossible, but it's, uh, it's very, very unlikely. So, um, so what is this? Because yeah, we have uh, among uh, the, the various types of common sense knowledge we have, we also uh, know about uh, the essentially the motion properties objects. We are able to distinguish objects which are static from objects which easily can be moved from one place uh, to another. So, okay, so so basically uh, um, from this analysis, uh, we we say, okay, can we can we, we equip Hans with common sense knowledge uh, uh, to improve the object recognition performance? And what types of common sense knowledge do we have? Uh, to try and uh, uh, represent the in enhance. So um, um, actually, let me just skip here. Yeah. So what, what, what we did, uh, we, we did uh, um, a formal uh, um, analysis of the errors, as I said, in which we use uh, um, different categories from a framework which uh, we built uh, uh, looking at the literature on, uh, on common sense, in particular, uh, probably two, two papers by Leketal and, and Hoffman. And, and basically, there are five five elements that are really, uh, or let's say six, including learning equal model building, 
but uh, basically what we are uh, you know what we're able to do is for example as i mentioned that there's something called motion vision that is you know there's um, evidence that uh, the human brain uh, you know uh, keeps uh, distinct representations for studying movie objects which means we we are very very good at distinguishing between things that are static and things that move and in fact it's even more than that because we're also very good uh, at keeping track of an object that moves over time so if we if we if we follow a, a car uh, passing down the street we are very able we are very good at uh, following that car and understanding that it's still the same car in the next frame um there is uh, um a lot of evidence again that uh, you know 3d is something that we construct uh, essentially in, in post processing from from 2d shapes um of, of course we have this very 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 fast uh, uh, perception mechanism that uh, means that not just with old objects but also with new objects we can recognize them extremely fast because we are very good at understanding uh, um, compositionality at, at uh, identifying the subparts of uh, objects and the special relations um, and something really i would say mind-blowing is that uh, um, there have been some experiments that show that uh, even uh, uh, infants, you know, younger than six months, uh, understand the certain basic physics principles like uh, inertia, which is uh, um, which is quite amazing. So, you know, the bottom line is that you know human, human beings are pretty good at uh, um, at understanding the world, and essentially the, the key thing is that uh, we we construct models of the world, and then we are able to keep. Uh, these models uh, up to date to dynamically change, but also to apply them to a situation that we have already uh, experienced before. So, um, what uh, uh, so what Agnese did was essentially to to look at how to operationalize this framework in uh, in a way which could be implemented. So that which means, for example, in terms of naive physics is to um, represent the physical properties of objects in, uh, uh, in a way that the robot can, can make use of this representation. Um, in terms of comp compositionality means to uh, you know, represent special reasoning part of relations and be, again, being able to reason about that. Uh, fast perception in a sense is an easy one. You know, DL methods um, can really provide extremely fast object recognition, at least on non categories not necessarily new ones. Um, generic to do view to do reviews again these are provided by existing kbs and motion vision means you know to equip uh, for example robots with ability to to um, uh, track objects all, all over time so as i said we did uh, these uh, uh, data error analysis and it turns out that uh, although there are uh, a number of explanations for the errors there are three uh, i would say elements of common sense that really stand out. One is um, the, the one I showed you with, the uh, example, the armchair, the mug, the, the relative size. If only Hans understands uh, uh, size, in particular relative size, then uh, we can, uh, we, we, in principle, you know, the hypothesis is that we should be able to improve its performance and object recognition. Um, Qualitative spatial reasoning, again, uh, was something that uh, uh, appeared in a number of errors. And the, the, the third thing is the example that uh, I gave you about the, the wind and the radiator motion trajectories, you know, the ability to, to understand the difference between objects that are movable, objects that are not movable, and the fact that no movable objects are unlikely to change over time in different observations. So equipped with these uh, um, uh, error analysis, uh, um, well, actually, let, let me see. Well, one other thing, of course, it turns out to be quite useful is also ability to read, um, which was not in the framework, but that, that's quite obvious. So we also did a, a KB coverage study. I won't have much time to talk about these, uh, but the interesting thing is basically the only, um, it turns out the only KB which has information about these uh, motion trajectories and difference between static and, and uh, movable objects is no rob. So uh, essentially this analysis was quite useful to identify gaps in the common sense knowledge that you can extract from existing KBs as opposed to building new, new ones. So, um, okay, so what, what we did in particular, what Agnes did was to say, okay, let's, uh, let's introduce a size reasoner and see whether the performance uh, improves. So, um, and, and uh, again, you know, in, in terms of uh, cognitive science, uh, um, there is quite a lot of evidence 
that uh, uh, we use size uh, big time to understand uh, um, the reality around us, um, as in the example of the armchair as mug. But basically, you know, there is, for example, there, there is the work by Eleanor Roche, which uh, which basically says that uh, we have, um, um, in, our, in our mind, we have essentially uh, canonical um, uh, understandings, you know, let's say understanding of canonical size. So we expect a bean to be of a certain size, we expect a car to be of a certain size, um, and uh, we use these again as, as part of our uh, way to uh, categorize and conceptualize uh, objects. So um, I, I, won't, you know, I won't give you all the boring details uh, of the size, of, except to say essentially, um, we we went for kind of qualitative. You know, we abstracted it from uh, the specific dimension of you know, for example, a, a cardboard box can be very small, can be very big, can be flat, can be uh, thick. You know, of course, it's flat when it's folded. So it appears in multiple shape. So what uh, what we did essentially was to uh, arrange uh, um, the representation size according to two dimensions. One is the depth, whether things are, are thick or, or flat. And the other one is the area, whether things are small or, or large. And these, um, um, these again, because uh, this allows us uh, um, to do much faster inference uh, um, when uh, um, Hans goes around trying to understand the objects. So we, we integrated this uh, size reason with the machine learning algorithm, with the deep learning algorithm. Uh, and the integration was done in, in, in a basic, in a, uh, according to a waterfall model, the kind of cascade model. Essentially, first we run the, the deep learning algorithm. And this, in this case, the, the deep learning says, well, um, this thing that in reality is a fire extinguisher, it seems to me like a bottle, because indeed the shape of the fire extinguisher is very similar to a bottle. And it essentially come, comes up with these um, uh, three ranked predictions. Um, is a bottle. If it's not a bottle, a fire extinguisher. If it's not a fire extinguisher, is a bean. So, um, once these uh, uh, predictions are passed to the uh, size uh, uh, reasoner, such a size reasoner um, says, well, that, that is much too big to be a bottle. You know, mo mo pretty much all the bottles I have in my knowledge base are smaller than that. So while it could, you know, the size is good enough to be a fire extinguisher and bean, so um, he, he validates fire extinguisher and bean as objects that satisfy the size um, criteria. Uh, but before, because fire extinguisher was ranked um, higher by the deep learning reason than being, e, uh, the output is uh, fire extinguisher. Um, so let's see whether this improves performance. As I showed you earlier, uh, you know the the, the Knet uh, reason uh, could only achieve 50 percent, uh, and uh, um, we we run a number of variations, but essentially the um, the last row here, the one in which basically use uh, the hybrid, you know, first the deep learning, and then use uh, all the information about size, both area and thickness, and thickness uh, um, basically produce uh, a, a five percent improvement over the baseline. So it's not uh, uh, unbelievably fantastic, but it's actually quite uh, quite quite meaningful, you know, as a five percent improvement. And the interesting thing is actually that um, if uh, um, if we take a slightly idealized scenario in which, uh, given the prediction, because uh, um, basically this uh, the, the the what we call the realistic scenario is everything is automatic. Essentially, if the deep learning system is very confident that something is a bottle, is not passed to the uh, size reasoner. The it, the information is only passed to the size reasoner if the deep learning system is not uh, very confident. Um, now, if uh, instead we only, um, if we remove the, the mistakes from the uh, deep learner, um, in the sense that we, we, um, we pass to the size reasoner only the uh, predictions that, uh, that are wrong, regardless of the confidence of the deep learning, then actually, the, the performance increased dramatically to 66%. So essentially, one of the problems, of course, with this uh, cascade architecture is at the end of the day, if uh, um, if you get uh, you know uh, garbage in, you get garbage out. 
So there is only a subset of the incorrect predictions that uh, can be fixed by a size reason because uh, um, we don't have perfect, you know, we assume a real world scenario in which the robot is completely autonomous. And therefore, we don't have perfect knowledge about the performance of the um, deep learning system. But nonetheless, 55% is, is an improvement of 50. So uh, an interesting thing we did even better on the Amazon Robotic Challenge, um, primarily because it's a much easier challenge um, with, um, with the test images, we achieved 88% um, um, performance uh, uh, compared to the 78 performance um, on, the, on the mixed uh, bottom new and uh, uh, new objects uh, and, and, all obje and, and known objects. Uh, okay, so um, as I showed you earlier, um, also the uh, you know it, it looked like it, it would be very useful to integrate a spatial reasoner. So we um, again, I'll speak some, I'll skip some of the details. Um, and basically, what we did, we you know we we did a very formal uh, um, uh, theory, um, essentially first order logic theory uh, in terms of forty axiom of all the spatial relations. That um, that we needed, uh, we did uh, quite uh, um, a, a lot of work on this notion of bounding box. Um, essentially, given an object, uh, you know, uh, the system automatically generates the, the minimum bounding box for that object. Because of course, the objects can have different shapes. But then, an interesting thing, of course, uh, in contrast with uh, a lot of the formal work on special reasoning, is that you know the robot viewpoint is dynamic. So we came up with the notion of a, a contextualized bounding box, which basically is uh, um, the minimum bounding box, uh, um, but rotated from the point of view uh, of the robot. So um, the end result uh, is something like this. And when a robot uh, analyzes uh, um, a scene in, in KMI, he can then extract a representation which is based on the, on the special primitives uh, um, that have been uh, um, formally defined in first order logic and then uh, implemented in uh, in Postgres, um, so that uh, so that uh, the the robot Hans is able to quite efficiently um, do reasoning on these um, on these special relations. So and the 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 other important thing about these special relations is not is then they also you know because at the end of the day we want to understand the world we use these uh, um, to support essentially common sense recognition that is. Uh, if I see uh, um, a keyboard next to a screen, um, that is much more likely to be a computer screen than a TV screen, uh, because statistically, you know, you, you get keyboard, it's much more likely to have keyboards next to computer screen than to TV screen. And, and uh, even more likely, if you have an object that looks like a computer mouse next to a keyboard, um, it's much more likely to be a computer mouse than another object with the same, Shape uh, which is uh, you know on a bed uh, separate from my computer, computer keyboard, etc. So essentially, we we tried uh, to um, to reproduce this sort of typicality reasoning that has been uh, uh, analyzed uh, in depth in uh, in cognitive science to improve the uh, the ability of hands to to recognize objects. Um, so uh, then the architecture itself becomes more interesting because we we add these uh, these special special reason. Uh, and then we have two reasoners, and then of course you have this uh, problem: how do we uh, organize the, the reasoning now? So what we did, we did a, a two different tests. Um, in, in the first test, uh, we have first uh, the the planning component, then we have the size reasoner, and then we have the spatial reasoner. So we have a sort of cascade of three reasoners. In the second test, uh, we have the the planning component, and then essentially we have the size reasoner, spatial reasoner in parallel. In which uh, um, the size reasoner uh, um, gets the input from the DL element, the special reasoner also gets the input from the DL element, and then essentially the um, the various ranking are combined. And uh, um, so, for example, like in, in this example, um, basically uh, there is the you know in fact it's the same example as before. Is bottle fire extinguisher bin is the ranking from DL. Um, we already seen the size reason. Uh, if you look at the special reason, the special reason say, hey, the bin is on floor, which makes sense. I have seen a lot of images of beans on floor. So that, that's consistent with that image. 
um, but also the fire extinguisher is near the fire extinguisher sign. So also that that's cons uh, consistent. So both fire extinguisher being a uh, plausible candidate for the spatial reasoner, fire extinguisher being a plausible candidate for the size reasoner. Again, we use the ranking, uh, the regional ranking from DL and we go for fire extinguisher again. So um, again, if you remember, we had uh, achieved the 55% with the NN plus size reasoner. Now we had the special reasoner. Now the special reasoner, of course, the moment you add the second component, then the, um, you have uh, more scenarios you know, in which you may assume a completely realistic case, in which Hans is completely autonomous, or you can uh, assume a completely uh, idealized case in which A, you know which uh, predictions from the um, deep learning component are correct and which ones are not correct. So you only pass the no correct one for fixing, but also uh, in the uh, qualitative spatial reasoner, of course, uh, if you um, want to use the other objects as uh, um, context to understand the object uh, in question that you are trying to, to classify, uh, of course, if you if the deep reason the deep learning component gets the other objects wrong, then of course it will it'll screw up uh, the special this quality special reason. So there is an idealized scenario in which everything that is passed to the side reason a quality uh, special reason is correct, and it is um, scenario A, and then there is the real world scenario D in which basically tough luck we don't know what is correct and what is not correct, and of course there are two intermediate uh, cases B and C. If we go straight to uh, D, the realistic case, we can see that again, uh, um, um, integrating the size of special reason in parallel produce a, a further improvement to 58%. I think, uh, and I don't have, um, yeah, I don't have here A. If we talk about A, you also get an improvement to 68%, um, but A is the one where idealizing which only incorrect uh, uh, only incorrect guess by the DL are passed on to the to the other reasoners. So uh, let's. Uh, uh, so basically, you know, the bottom line is that we started by from a baseline of fifty percent um, uh, performance in terms of F measure, and we now go to fifty eight. So um, the final uh, piece in the puzzle then is to represent uh, the health and safety rules. So. This is the input uh, uh, that uh, we got from the health and safety people. This is the kind of uh, inspection form and guidelines that um, you know a human inspector uh, needs to follow. So we um, transformed these into rules uh, that were encoded into hands. Uh, for example, like um, the first one is waste and rubbish kept in this designated area. You cannot uh, keep rubbish everywhere in in the lab. The, just uh, you know, two or three specific areas where rubbish can be kept. Um, um, again, we formalize this uh, as a first order logic statement. And the important thing is, as you can see in the second one, ignition check, that of course we make use of this, uh, the special relations, the qualitative special relations defined in uh, in our uh, QSR framework. And um, and then bingo, we we launch the hands with these. Uh, um, uh, object recognition system augmented with the with any special reason and size reason and with the rules for health and safety. So let's keep the screen snapshot. Let's go straight. I will show you a quick video and then uh, and then we will finish. So these, uh, um, yeah. So this is just hands going around. Uh, the position, of course, is tracked. The hands has a map knows, for example, which areas are suitable for rubbish, which areas are not suitable for rubbish. Um, so here, you know, it looks at the, the, the fire extinguisher. It needs to understand what they are. Um, and uh, in fact, let's, uh, let's just move forward to, okay, um, to the risk assessment routine. So for example, here uh, is looking at these um, fire extinguisher. Um, use the qualitative special. Let's, say, oh, let's just go back. Let's. Uh, hey, can you go? Okay. Ah, sorry about that. How do I stop this? There's a pause button. Uh, yeah, button. Yeah, yeah, I found it. <laughs> um, uh, sorry for the more videos. This comes from uh, YouTube, not from me. 
Um, so yeah, uh, this just shows you the way um, the situation is represented. So you, uh, it's possible this two-phase extinguisher with a certain confidence 0 0.9, 0 0.5. So um, he is able to deduce uh, uh, using the quality of special reason uh, that um, um, the right uh, relation is a fixed on this due on the wall. And he gets this information uh, um, about um, uh, to be inspected to be self executed from existing knowledge bases like uh, uh, Cosimodo and, and ShapeNet. And then he moves on. So let's click on the, on the arrow. And uh, okay. And then now um, he says, okay, are they securely wall mounted? Yes. Are they accessible? Or, yeah, there was nothing to restrict. Are portable fire extinguisher clearly labeled? He says no. Um, and the reason for this is that the object recognition didn't spot. Uh, the labels, the labels are there. So this is a, a failure of the uh, essentially of the deep learning system that fails to spot the the labels. So let's let's move on and see, and look at another scenario. Okay, in this case, you know, this is a case I was showing you at the very beginning of book next to electric ether. Um, and this is also shows you uh, a little bit of the the trace um, of the system, you know, is, is trying all the various, you know, is doing the object recognition and trying all the various rules. Um, and in this case, uh, um, he finds a, a rubbish bin outside the next neck there, and then he is a warning. Is another case in which there is a trip hazard, and again, this is uh, properly uh, properly spotted. Okay, I think you have seen enough uh, to get excited uh, about ants. So let's, uh, okay, let's go uh, to the conclusion. So bottom line is that, um, you know, using this hybrid approach uh, as opposed to a, a purely deep learning approach, we have improved uh, the performance of Hans by 8% from 50 to 58. Um, there's still a lot more work that can be done, but uh, that, I think that proves um, um, the value of combining these, uh, these two paradigms, especially because a lot of the errors downstream uh, are really errors upstream uh, in the sense that, uh, as I say, that we don't assume an oracle that tells that only pass on incorrect predictions for fixing, we just pass on everything. Therefore, um, the errors uh, um, errors in the sense of uh, things that DL things are correct are propagated uh, down, downstream. Um, and uh, an approach to, of, of this type of uh, architecture is that, uh, as you can see from the analysis, uh, I, I presented that we can very clearly understand the, the, the value of the different components, which is much more difficult if you try and embed the, the domain knowledge directly into the DL component. And of course, in terms of future work, um, actually, Agnese is currently working on um, precision farming in Italy, applying these uh, uh, techniques to robots uh, in, in agriculture. And also, we have a project um, together with Samsung for robotic assistance in the home, in which, of course, you want a robot to make sense of the home environment, to, for example, to identify possible hazards for elderly people in the in the home. And of course, there are, there is more that can be done also in terms of uh, uh, adding common sense components. Okay, I'll uh, stop here. Uh, thank you very much for your attention.